Sounds like all the Intel CPUs have been hacked and maybe ARM and AMD. Should you panic or is this whole thing overblown? New laptops from Lenovo, Dell and HP, Ryan's cord cutting finale and cheap Apple batteries. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 447, recorded January 4th, 2018. Intel CPUs hacked. Should you panic? This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Tracker, a coin sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit the tracker.com slash twitch to save 20% off any order. And buy Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most delightful, most informative, and most stressed before CES hardware coverage around, especially the day after a giant vulnerability security style is revealed that involves every single processor practically ever. I'm exaggerating slightly as Mr. Ryan Trout, who joins me from the ever so cold Kentucky, might tell you. Ryan. Hey. It is cold. It's like 15. It's going to be zero when I leave for the airport tomorrow. Um, so that's cold. That's cold. Cold. Yeah. cold. Um, I like how Cory Doctorow put it. Uh, virtually every modern computer is vulnerable to a pair of devastating attacks, and there's only a fix for one of them, and it sucks. Um, that is about... <laughs> Uh, as simple as it gets, uh, I love Corey. He's normally out there fighting for internet freedoms, writing amazing science fiction, but he's still a geek. Um, and it really comes down to uh, a couple of vulnerabilities that were introduced. Uh, they've, they, they were uh, the Linux community, the Windows community, the OS 10 community, or I should say the Linux community and, and Microsoft and Apple have been working on patches for this. What we're talking about is Meltdown and Spectre. And I'm going to quote specterattack.com is the website um, uh, that, that describes what's going on with this. Um, quote, Meltdown and Spectre exploit critical vulnerabilities in modern processors. These hardware bugs allow programs to steal data, which is currently processed on the computer. While programs are typically not permitted to read data from other programs, a malicious program can exploit Meltdown and Spectre to get hold of secrets stored in the memory of other running programs. This might include your password stored in the password manager or browser, your personal photos, emails, instant messages, or even business critical documents. So if you work, say, for a three-letter agency, you are freaking out right now. If you are Google, Amazon, um, pretty much any major company that runs servers with a ton of data, uh, uh, or, or worse yet, if you are a company that has data scattered across virtual private servers, this is pretty scary, right? Um, Every Intel processor, and I'm quoting it again here from the Spectre Attack FAQ, technically, every Intel processor which implements out-of-order execution is potentially affected, which is effectively every processor since 1995 except Intel Itanium and Intel Atom before 2013. We successfully tested mm -hmm. Meltdown and Intel processor generations released as early as 2011. Currently, we have only verified Meltdown on Intel processors. At the moment, it is unclear whether ARM and AMD processors are also affected by Meltdown. And as you would expect, uh, Intel is pushing that AMD and ARM uh, could or are impacted. AMD says they aren't vulnerable, um, but this is huge. This is beyond. This is beyond operating system. Um, this is uh, you know happening at a very very deep level uh, of the processor. Um, yeah, know, and like I said, you know this is, you know this will impact you, or this could potentially impact you. As far as you know, it's not out in the wild. Um, you know, but we are talking about is the ability for malicious code to be executed. And what you're seeing right there is essentially, uh, malicious code in an application accessing data from other applications on the computer. This is what we call bad, uh, in the security industry. Not that I'm in the security industry. Uh, some <laughs> friends of mine, 
uh, who are they? They are uh, red team pen testers or security professionals working for really big companies. I was talking to a friend of mine, and uh, and he's he's you know, I cannot use the phrase uh, he used to describe this, um, but let's just say it's a euphemism for really really bad. Um, probably scarier for companies like Google and Amazon, every VPS host on the planet, uh, every massive company that uses a tremendous amount of servers uh, or works in the cloud, which is pretty much everybody. Um, but you're vulnerable too, which means you need to patch. And that's where things get kind of sucktastic. Because um, the rumor on the Windows patch is that they could slow your machine uh, by up to 30%. Um, on the upside, uh, if you have a fairly late model processor that's fairly fast, um, you know, uh, it may not impact you as much. TechSpot did a really nice uh, write-up testing Windows 10 performance before and after the Meltdown Flaw emergency patch. And, you know, I was expecting to see massive drops, but you're looking at, like, you know, in terms of SSD benchmarks, disk marks, um, you know, 3D content creating and rendering, um, hmm. it is not nearly as painful as I thought it would be. Uh, you hmm. know, for example, you know, it's going from, uh, like, Cinebench CV points, you know, drops from 1,423 down to 1,391. So it takes an Intel Core i7 8700K to just below, from basically an equal to a Ryzen 7 1700 or to just slower than a Ryzen uh, 7 1700. Uh, but still faster than an Intel Core 7 7800X that hasn't been patched. Um, you know, this, this is not the best way uh, to sort of evaluate this. But if, you're, if you have a late model processor, it might not be as emotionally traumatizing uh, as it probably will be on an older processor. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, it is not as, as terrifying as I thought it would be. The game benchmarks look like they are, you know, we're talking about three or four frames. Um, you know, Battlefield DX11 going from 181 frames per second into 177 frames per second. You know, a couple frames here, nope. a couple frames there. So... You know, I'm curious to see what will happen to older processors when the patch is applied. Um, but certainly in terms of later model processors, it should not be. You know, I saw 30 percent and I was just like, oh, God, no. Um, Linux patches are being tested by Pharonix. Um I, you know, this is, you know, the, the thing that kind of blows me away the most about this is that this is going to change how processors are architected. Like, I don't know if they're going to scrap Good. current architectures of processors, but this is this is a big deal. Mm. Uh, and so, you know. Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> here's the thing. Am, right? I, am, the, I, am, I too, am I too chicken little on this? Um, I don't, uh, the truth is I don't, I don't know for sure. I would say that... <clears throat> <laughs> it would take a monumental event to occur for the last 20 years of CPU direction to suddenly be erased. Um, basically, the the flaw that Spectre exploits is it's not a it's not a bug in the processor. It's not um, some uh, some error on Intel or AMD's part or something like that. It is a kind of a fundamental design choice of out of order architecture. The ability to uh, try to look ahead in what the computing task is trying to do to pre compute or pre fetch data um, is, is how we have seen IPC improvements is one of the primary reasons we have seen IPC improvements at all over the last, you know, however many years you want to, you want to dive into 10, 15. Um, it is possible to, th there's two ways to do it. One is to erase everything and start over with brand new CPU architectures and designs. Um, and I think we would revert significantly in performance if we did that. The other is to, um, do the uh, finger in a hole in a dam type of thing mm -hmm. for a very long time. Like every time a specific exploit or a specific um, a vulnerability crops up uh, with any kind of detail, we have the ability to patch software uh, to do that. Um, 
you know, Intel, I think even Intel today has come out and said, hey, we believe that the patches that uh, are being applied through the Linux kernel updates, through the Windows uh, software updates are essentially making this a non-issue. I don't agree with that, mm -hmm. but I do believe that the exploit is significantly more difficult to pull off than the the reports and the reporting right. of them make it sound right. And there's the video on the website that shows you just typing in a, somebody typing in a field and the other field revealing what it is. And that's that's being able to specifically architect an instance how that occurs. Right. Um, right. I think it's a really big deal. I think it's a it's a it's a problem. But I don't. I, I am not a chicken. I'm not chicken. I'm not uh, uh, claiming that the sky is falling yet, <laughs> uh, especially considering that AMD doesn't isn't affected by the third variant, right? The one that only affects right. Intel, essentially, or in a couple of uh, the two newest ARM architectures. Unfortunately for them, um, shows me that there that there are ways to design around this, mm -hmm. but. What that will mean for performance long term and that type of stuff, I I don't I don't I don't know. I, I I would my my recommendation last night on an interview was like if you're a consumer, you install your Windows update patches and there's nothing really you can do, right? Unless you're gonna go back to pen and paper, there there isn't a whole lot that you can suddenly change about your processor, right? Because Spectre is going to exist for everything. It is it is speculative uh, pre compute processing across the board uh, that is at risk. But, you know, it's more important for the cloud space, it's more important for the enterprise and VM space, uh, where the idea of multiple clients on the same PC, on the same physical hardware is more complicated. And now I might be able to see what my uh, co-hosted VM user is doing. That might reveal sensitive information. Um, but I feel like, I feel, I don't know this, I'm not a security expert either, that there will be a software fix around that, right? Even if it comes at a hypervisor level, if it comes at an OS level, um, to separate some of that stuff out, but uh, I mean, it's 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 a pretty big deal. Ask Intel stock yesterday how big of a deal it was. But I'm not I'm not telling somebody to return their processor. I'm not telling somebody to, to not buy a processor in today's market because of it. Um, so I, I don't it, I don't know what else what other impact there might be. So dialing back from my enthusiastic panic, part of it. So part of part of my Part of my reaction to this was based on a couple of security professionals I know, uh, one of which was like uh, the guy who administers all the stuff uh, at the warehouse was was basically checking the operating system that's run on the computers, the Chromebooks in the warehouse, that, and then making sure that they are set up to get the update as soon as it's available. Um, you know, yeah. I am heartened, I will say, in that the, the software patch does not seem to have the impact uh, that we thought it was going to have, which is a big deal. Yeah. Um, at least I think with that's the like from an, processors. Yeah. yeah oh, sorry, I was going to say, I think from the enthusiast standpoint, like there were two things we were worried about yesterday. One is the security vulnerability side of it. The other one is, is the fix for this going to impact my performance? And I think I think the right. benchmarks you talked about and you showed uh, and, and kind of the initial testing I've seen proves that it's probably not the case that it's going to have a significant improvement, right? If you think back to every generation, we've gone from Sandy Bridge to Ivy Bridge to whatever. And we always talk about like how little IPC improvement there has been, right? Uh, that's kind of always been the complaint of processors in recent years. Right. Um, you know, branch prediction, uh, those types of speculative processing things are even a very small part of that thing. So if, if we have to roll back some of that for it, it's not going to hit 30% unless you are worst case scenarioing it, not in a real world scenario is my guess. Um, okay. So in my mind, you know, there will be class action lawsuits. There will be uh, people who accuse Intel of uh, uh, <clears throat> lying about the performance levels of the process. And the truth is, it's not really the case. Intel's not at fault here. They didn't do anything wrong. Um, right. It's just very, very, very good security researchers took advantage of an idea that's really only been provable, as, as Alex sent to me in a text here, that's only been provable to even be possible in the last five years, these kind of side channel security issues. Um, and now it's shown to be an exploit. So now the, the, it just matters, it just, to me, it just will change how things are directed going forward. 
but I just don't, I don't see a, a large scale reversion in compute design. Okay. Makes sense to me. I, you know, it yeah. was, it was important for me. I think, I think to lead the show on this because, um, I've certainly got, you know, when my relatives are calling up asking about security problems, uh, usually either means they've been hacked, um, or that something gotten enough coverage, uh, to have, uh, the industry in full panic mode. I think it was, I think it's, it was particularly interesting for me because we, we always hear so much about, you know, my operating system is secure. My operating system is secure. Your operating system isn't secure as mine. I'm safe because I don't use your operating system. And then to have somebody come in at such an incredibly low level of the processor is kind of fascinating. Um, you know, yeah, keep your Windows updates on, keep your OS 10 updates on. Uh, if you're a sysadmin, you're already in hell and you know what to do. Um, <laughs> and as far as we know, none of this has been implemented in the wild. And there is, as, as uh, the text message pointed out to you, we really don't know if it will be executable in the wild uh, or how it might be. Um, right. But uh, certainly worth keeping an eye on and uh, update your system. Uh, well, your automatic updates if you're on Windows should be on already. And if they're not really, it's time. Uh, uh, if you're <laughs> if you're not on Windows uh, Windows 10, and if it does slow yeah. down your computer to 30 percent, it may have been time to buy a new PC, and hopefully you can afford one. I don't know. We'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also I should say I'm a little paranoid because I had a, a, a credit card get schwacked uh, or a debit card get schwacked over the holidays, and I'm like. Oh, great. So now I'm going to be carrying cash again and avoiding using any kind of card that does not use a chip <laughs> processor, which is really problematic in my part of the world because there's a whole lot of vendors around here, vendors, stores, restaurants uh, that don't have chip readers yet. I'll be thinking about that in Las oh, Vegas yeah. next week. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. There you go. More cheerful news. Let's talk about finding your lost stuff. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Tracker. We are all looking for something, love, purpose, unforgettable experiences, a more secure processor. Mostly, though, I find I'm looking for my keys. Eight years ago, Tracker changed everything when they released their first tracking device, and now Tracker's done it again, the new Tracker Pixel. With Tracker Pixel, you'll never worry about losing your things again. It is the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. Just place the Pixel on whatever you tend to lose, your keys, your wallets, your remote small enough to fit on your smallest items. And when you misplace an item that has a tracker pixel attached, you just go to the tracker app on your smartphone, you press a button, and a 90 decibel alert will help you find it in seconds. It's loud, people. It even has powerful LED lights so you can track your items in the dark, which is really awesome if you uh, like to keep all the lights out in the house like I do or get stuck in the warehouse with the lights out in the dark corner. If you lose your phone, find one of the devices with a tracker pixel on it, Press the button, your phone's going to ring even if it's on silence. And I can think of at least two family members that I should get a tracker pixel for just so they don't lose their phone as often. You can even locate your item if it's miles away because every tracker user is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. The tracker's 30 day money back guarantee means you truly have nothing to lose. Go to the tracker. Dot com slash twitch to save 20% off any order. That's T H E T R A C K R dot com slash T W I C H for 20% off. The tracker dot com slash twitch. We want to thank Tracker for their support of this week in computer hardware and for helping people everywhere find missing stuff. It's a good thing. It is, it is. Mm -hmm. Man, a flood, a bunch of laptop announcements are coming at CES that we can't talk about. Um, but we can talk about uh, the updates for the ThinkPacks X, ThinkPack, the ThinkPad, Lenovo's ThinkPad X, T, and L series, uh, HN Intel processors, improved I.O., and thinner designs. Are you salivating over the new uh, Lenovo, sir? You know, I I don't know yet. I, <clears throat> so these are, these are kind of more, your more traditional ThinkPad lines. The X series is a laptop I've used for a very, very, very long time, but I haven't used a lot recently <clears throat> just because the thinner, lighter, sexier designs kind of came uh, around and um, had acceptable enough battery life. When I first got into the X series or the T series, it was all about battery life, exclusively about being able to get through that that flight to Taipei or whatever uh, without having to, to worry about recharging or something like that. Um, the <clears throat> like the X1 series is kind of now where I focus out on my Lenovo uh, laptop appearances, though the idea of really long battery life and the idea of uh, 
still having, you know, replaceable batteries after all this time, which is something that's almost become a novelty at this point <laughs> is, is, or is, is kind of impressive. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know. The, what's interesting to me is I don't, I, I'm curious how much of the, of the enterprise market or business or SMB market that is, you know, essentially the target of these specific Lenovo laptops um, care about things like the yoga uh, capability of the X380 yoga, right? There's the X280 that doesn't have it. Um, but because you have the yoga variant, you kind of preclude yourself from having that replaceable battery in that particular workload or, or that particular design style, right? Because it has to be able to bend and flex through it. Something just collapsed in the corner. So interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> but... But you look at the T-Series and there's one that claims up to 27 hours of battery life if you consider with the with configure with the extendable battery, which is like uh, astounding, you know? Yeah. Um, what it actually lives up to, we'll have to see. Um, but definitely impressive. And, you know, they started under a thousand bucks, but they go much higher depending on how you configure it or whatever. And they introduced the uh, ThinkPad L-Series, which is a little bit lower cost, kind of a um, value-focused business line, they call it. They have both yoga form factors and traditional clamshell form factors. Um, but I interesting designs that I think Lenovo needs to have in order to continue their, you, you know, the markets that they are the leaders in. But a little disappointing that there's not a lot of changes here, that there's not anything radically different. I just don't know if that's a market that wants any of that, that is asking for anything radically different, too. Interesting question. Um, one of the other things uh, uh, dropped uh, just this morning, uh, uh, Thursday morning, uh, new Dell XPS 13, um, which was interesting for me, right? Because I, I am using a Dell XPS 13 that I've just upgraded to uh, with the 8th gen Kaby Lake processor. Um, and uh, it was uh, it was funny because you first you look at it, and it's like, oh, they've got Alpine white and rose gold, right? It's a new color. Uh, and um, yeah, there you go, right? There's the, the, the Alpine white on the right. And they did some crazy material science, uh, both on the outside of the laptop and the inside, the, you know, a woven glass fiber palm rest, which they're basically saying uh, they went out of their way to make it really impossible or at least very, very difficult for your child to go nuts with a Sharpie and, and ruin it. Um, feels really, really nice in, in hand. Um, but inside, things get incredibly geeky. They uh, went to uh, two uh, thermal pipes, and uh, two fans, or basically changed the, 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 the heat pipe and fan design, and added a layer of Gore-Tex thermal insulation. First laptop to ever use this stuff, um, it's a Gore-Tex fabric with silica aerogel embedded in it. So, you know, we're like satellite insulation technology. And the idea is that it's going to um, keep the heat inside the pipes and headed out the fans in the back uh, and disperse it away from your tender flesh, whether it's on the keyboard side or the bottom side of the laptop. I'm curious to see if that's going to actually add performance to the current 8th gen Kaby Lake CPUs or if they're adding thermal capacity for future CPUs in the Intel lineup. Um, less Mr. Science and, and more this is a step in the right direction is they've also, uh, I'm, I'm using a Dell XPS right now where the camera is right down there uh, and they've moved it to the center of the monitor. So if you've noticed... Uh, my webcam has disappeared, so I'm using the, the one inside the laptop for a change. Um, you know, it's still below the screen, which is not my favorite, um, but centering it, I think, is a good step, uh, unless you sort of like that off-angle, uh, you know, millennial YouTube video kind of look. Um, two Thunderbolt Types 3 C ports that can charge connected devices or uh, run uh, two 4K displays. Um, third USB-C port that can also charge the laptop. And they still put a micro SD card adapter in there, uh, which I really appreciate. Uh, and Dell promises, mm -hmm. I'd love this, that there'll be a USB-A to C adapter in the box with the new Dell XPS 13. Um, prices start at uh, just under $1,000. Um, and the other thing that was, was announced this week was uh, HP has a couple of new Chromebooks. Um, the uh, And I thought these were interesting in terms of the specs. Um, Chromebook 11 G6 Education Edition and the Chromebook 14 G5. Uh, you can get up to 8 gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigs of uh, eMMC storage. 
and they'll be running either an Intel Celeron N3350 or 3450. And HP is saying it's a 26% bump in performance over the previous designs. Um, big difference between these two uh, is the intended markets and the size. The 11-inch G6 Education Edition uh, is actually going to fit in your child's backpack. And it features a, quote, strengthened corner design and co-molded rubber contact points. And if you're a teacher or a parent, you know why, uh, to make it more bomb-proof. Uh, and then the G5, which is their more corporate model, uh, the 14-inch model, has a 14-inch screen. It's a little bit thinner than the 11-inch version because less armor. Uh, and they both have USB-C ports, A ports, built-in mics, webcams. Uh, touchscreens are optional. Um, but uh, I'll be curious to see the pricing on that. I haven't looked that up yet this morning. Um, but it's nice to see some Chrome OS devices that uh, or some Chromebooks that uh, have a fair amount of memory available and a fair amount of local storage available. I think it is a move in the right direction if you're living La Vida Chrome. Uh, just thinking about that one. Mm -hmm. So, oh my goodness. And everybody at CES next week is announcing new laptops, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, there will be there will be a lot of those. Um, it's it's interesting to see Dell announce these early. Lenovo announce announce a set early, almost like they're all kind of making room for these upcoming announcements, like the future announcements and stuff. I guess it kind of makes sense. They're all based on existing hardware and and, and devices and stuff. Um, but uh, you know, I don't want to say disappointing because I'm glad this is working out this way. It kind right. of spreads out the coverage a little bit, reduces the workload on day one uh, to a great degree. I, I've been a big fan of the XPS 13 for a long time. I, I still, I don't know if I can get over the camera placement anymore. As I travel more and kind of <laughs> depend more on the webcam than I thought I ever had, the number right. of times that the placement was was a drag for me um, is, is, is was why, higher than I expected. Yeah, it's it's why I normally have a webcam in my bag, but it's missing, so I have to figure out. Well, I guess I'm finally going to buy a, a new webcam. <laughs> I've been avoiding that for so long, and now it's, yeah. it's going to be necessity. Oh, there's the core thermal insulation. Yeah, it's it's an interesting. You know, it's it's a there's a definite internal redesign. Um, you know, and I'm curious to see what shows up also from Dell uh, Dell next week. I mean, one of the other mm -hmm. things that came out is. Uh, uh, LG announced their 2018 lineup of televisions uh, before CES, which I thought was interesting. Um, you know, a lot of people have seen the news about the 88-inch 8K OLED. Um, you know, they'll make one for you. That's not something you're going to find for sale pretty much anywhere. Um, but basically, it's like the W8 series, the wallpaper OLED, um, LG's new A9 intelligent processor. Um, and that's going to show up. It's interesting because one of the fascinating things about LG this year was most of their OLED screens shared the same screen and processor. So uh, at this point, uh, you know, the, the A9 processor is going to show up in the W8, E8, and C8 OLED, TVs, uh, OLED TVs. Uh, and then there's a, a slightly less fantastic version of that that's going to be in the B8 uh, OLED and LG Super UHD TV line. Um, Google Assistant's going to be integrated which I think we're going to probably see a lot of voice control. Uh, I was laughing because uh, I finally picked up uh, I finally picked up a uh, an Alexa, uh, uh, an Echo Spot. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to say A L E X A, uh, and a Google Home Mini, so I can start playing around with them in the garage as much as I don't want to. Uh, but uh, LG says uh, there's not going to be as much functionality implemented, but they will also do uh, Amazon's A L E X A. Um, Pretty much going to look very, very similar, uh, uh, but uh, uh, LG's claiming that their Super UHD LED is going to have uh, some big improvements in picture quality. We will know a lot more about that uh, next week. Um, and LG's also, they're trying to support all the HDR formats, Dolby Vision, HDR10, HLG, Advanced HDR by Technicolor, most of which you will probably never actually see content in, but that's a conversation for another day with Robert Heron where you can listen to him laugh hysterically <laughs> about this. Um, HDR10 Plus uh, not currently available. Uh, I think any. I don't think we're going to see much of that this year. Um, what is interesting though is um, there's going to be a high frame rate enabled on 4K this year. Um, so like 120 frames per second 4K video. Um, we'll know more about that in the none too distant future. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm curious to see what the pricing these out. And they're basically saying all of their TVs will be available between I want to say March and June of this year. 
Samsung's completely mum at this point. TCL's completely mum at this point. But, of course, they will be having massive events in the early days mm-hmm. of uh, CES Press Day. And we will cover more of that then. Mm. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Mortgage experience is just painful, dated. It needed a client-focused technological revolution, which is why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple. Allows you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's powerful. It doesn't matter if it's your first home or your 10th. Rocket Mortgage can perform thousands of calculations in seconds to help you make a smart decision. Based on your income, your assets, your credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all the home loan options for which you qualify and find the one that's just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans applies simply. Understand fully mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash twitch. That's rocketmortgage.com slash T-W-I-C-H. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. Oh, my goodness. You are uh, practically have one foot on the plane to Las Vegas. I'll be driving down there on Saturday nights. Um, you guys put up uh, on PCPro.com part three of the ultimate cord cutting guide. What's happening? In that one? Yes. So this is kind of uh, the conclusionary statement uh, segment. I don't know what you want to call it. So basically this is kind of what happened after we used it for a while. We did discover a couple of quirks. One of the things that we wanted to do with this, we're using a shield. We're, we're, we're using, uh, we were going to use antenna base for OTA uh, Plex had integrated OTA live TV support with DVR capability that they've had in there for a while. Uh, and one of the, actually one of the kind of the quirks we found was that the live TV stuff worked almost great on almost uh, on Plex. It had like little stutters, little hitches, little pauses in it that oddly only showed up when you were watching this show live, not if you recorded it and then watched it back. Uh, and it was very repeatable, kind of a very consistent thing for us. And we tried it on a local network. We tried it on uh, remote networks. Even more odd, the reason we 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 know it's a it was a Plex issue is that you can access the HD home run, which is what we were the device we were using to convert the antenna into a network interface thing that the different software and hardware could use. You could access that remotely just like through Windows and watch a stream, and it did not exhibit the same. Kind of small stutters. It was almost watchable, but wasn't wasn't perfect. Um, the The solution for me was, or for us rather, was kind of to adopt one of the over the top streaming services like YouTube TV or sure. View or Directv Now, and we decided on YouTube TV. It had a best it had the best integration with um, the Shield TV and Android TV. It was the lowest cost at thirty five dollars. It didn't have quite as many channels as the TV that I had been using previously, uh, but it's pretty close and it had all the locals. And that was kind of the key to us, right? Is if, if we weren't going to use the Plex live TV for watching our local channel, CBS, ABC, NBC, Fox, we needed to have one of the services that definitely had all those. And that's been a problem with the over the top services for a little while is sometimes the locals uh, weren't included. Um, that being said, everything else from that point kind of worked pretty fluidly and pretty easily. We talked about, the story talks about the bandwidth uh, increases um, at our house, which is, you know, I I don't work from the house, so our bandwidth consumption is generally pretty low. Uh, About, it was, previously it was about 200 gigs per month that we use, but after moving over to the -the over-the-top stuff uh, and, and all streaming cord cutting, we're over almost 550 gigs per month. So, not a problem for us. Our our uh, provider doesn't even have a bandwidth cap, but I know that it, in some places they do. You guys have like a one terabyte cap on uh, Comcast, right? So I used to. I am no longer a- on Comcast. Oh, um, okay, good. <laughs> but it's it's something worth keeping in mind yeah. if you do this, right? If if you look at your monitoring and you're already kind of like in the 700, 800 range, it's going to be a struggle for you. Um, and and keeping in mind that that 550 is without, like like I said, I'm not downloading games there. All the games and stuff that we download are at the office. We're not doing a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, my, my kid's not old enough to be downloading a bunch of content as she goes, right? She's not on YouTube 24 hours a day or anything like that. So 
the 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 bandwidth limit is is real and could be a concern if you if you have to if you have to worry about a cap. Let me go into the cost savings. I was paying just over $110 a month, and now you're looking at $40, so you're saving $70 to $80 a month. Obviously, you have to amortize that over the cost of the devices that we bought this experiment, the Shield TV, uh, the external hard drive, the HD home run, uh, the antenna, that type of stuff. But at the end of it, not only do you, you have a physical item um, that you've kind of, if you think about it that way, you've paid off over 10 months of cord cutting, uh, you have a lot more of additional functionality too, right? The Plex is offering stuff that you couldn't have gotten otherwise, that you can't do otherwise. You have the ability to watch TV in any area, any, on any device with YouTube TV or almost, right? Um, so you have a lot more capability and flexibility than you would with kind of a legacy TV solution. Uh, I, re I was replacing Cincinnati Bell Phi Optics TV service, um, you know, cable companies uh, of, of a similar vein. So I think the, the kind of conclusion we came to is that, hey, guess what? Still not perfect. But a lot, a lot closer now that the over-the-top solutions like YouTube TV, PlayStation View have local channels and um, are, are pretty good. Um, there's still nothing quite as good as the image quality you get with antenna-based over-the-air HD true. signals. Um, race. <laughs> yeah, f true. But, but like, uh, you know, watching... Uh, NBC, you know, Sunday night football on the antenna versus watching it through YouTube TV. There's a, there's a significant, I don't say significant, there's a noticeable picture quality difference. Um, Absolutely. That will bother some people and other, most people just won't care, right? But um, for me, it was like, mm, okay, what I really want is Plex to get its OTA stuff working so that I can use kind of essentially one homogenized application for all of this, just get those little little bugs figured out, um, which we have started engaging with them on now after they read the story. So we'll see if they if they can come up with any solutions to our particular situation that may apply to others. But a, a good experiment, you know, you're saving money. Seventy bucks a month is not chump change, uh, but it's also not going to light the world on fire. So you have to weigh the the value of that seventy dollars versus the frustration slash complication of going the cord cutting route. It's I, as somebody who cut the cord um, a long time ago, uh, was cordless, you know, around the time when the first Apple TV came out, then around the beginnings of Game of Thrones, had satellite TV for a couple of years, then basically went back to doing everything online again. Um, and a lot of it's about changing your viewing habits. And for me, I started having a lot more quality viewing because I wasn't like, click, 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 let's just search through 473 channels. Um, although statistically, most people do like 90% of their viewing on four channels and the majority of their browsing across. I think last numbers I saw for about 24 channels, people average, you know, the average person with like 500 channels of cable, uh, you know, does most of their viewing on four, four channels. And, and, and I found I was wasting a lot less time, but I will say as somebody who has, you know, I've got a nice 1080p projector, I've got a nice screen and it is really frustrating because one, as the content gets spread out more and more. It's something we've talked about a bunch on AVXL, right? Disney's going to pull their stuff and the Marvel stuff and the Star Wars stuff over here. And Netflix is doing their content over here. And somebody's got an exclusive there. And maybe you want to do HBO Go for this. You start incrementally boosting uh, the amount of cash you're spending. And I'm nowhere near the outrageous amount Comcast was charging for cable television here in the Bay Area. Um, but I'm probably spending twice as much now as I was five years ago on streaming content. And it's been frustrating because despite the fact that I have a pretty massive pipe coming into my house, um, you know, it is noticeable the compression that's used, especially when I'm watching action films or stuff with a lot of dark, you start becoming abundantly aware of, you know, the huge difference between uh, a Blu-ray um, and a streaming version of a movie. And uh, that's been really frustrating and, and, and it's been curious, I will call it for lack of a better word. Um, uh, to see what happens with image quality. Because at this point, I've used a couple different ISPs and a bunch of different platforms. And uh, I don't know. I, welcome to the, the cord cutting world, sir. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, it was an advantage for me because I was like watching no local television uh, and no sports. And that's about, uh, uh, about as easy a transition as you can get. Although I will say Major League Baseball yeah. is spectacular uh, on, the, on the streaming world. or in the On the streaming, streaming service. Yeah, agreed.
Oh my goodness. Green. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, that is the foundation for everything that Disney has done and will be doing in terms of, of streaming all of their content. And it is pretty amazing. Vega makes an appearance on Cobby Lake G. Really? <laughs> is that going to happen? It appears so. The rumors are now after. So apparently the Indian Intel site leaked this part on their version of Arc, which is kind of like the, the spec site or no, it was on it was on like an overclocking gaming page. They listed this processor, the 8809G Core i7-8809G. Uh, had frequencies at 3.1 gigahertz. HP leaked it in uh, a system on their website, I think, you know, quad core hyper threaded. And they, it's specific. One of the questions about after the announcement of the Radeon and Intel partnership was what GPU architecture were they going to use? Would AMD actually give Intel uh, the Vega architecture? Um, or would it be a player space thing that had been hacked together to use HBM? memory and as it turns out based on the modeling and the descriptors it is vega mgh graphics is the is the not so great name that that's been a, a associated with it so it does appear that um the cabby lake g slash g series slash radeon intel plus radeon uh, processors are going to use vega based gpus on them with kind of an unknown performance level but uh based on the rumored tdps of 100 watts or so uh, potentially pretty performant. Um, if you look at an H series Intel processor by itself, you're probably looking at like 35 to 40 watts. If you look at an MX150, you're looking at probably another 35 watts. So you're in the 70 to 75, 80 range TDP level. If Intel can can get, can use a little bit more power than that in some of these designs and get significantly more performance out it'd be really interesting to see what these systems look like what the performance looks like you know is this going to end up in a small four-factor pcs or all-in-ones probably um it's a pretty exciting new product and and while it was exciting at first just because oh my gosh amd and intel are working together on this semi-custom gpu that intel is purchasing and applying into these parts uh kind of a fundamental shift in in, in the cpu landscape uh now the now the excitement is about what is this performance going to be? What are the systems uh, around it? The notebooks going to be? 100 watts is still a, still a, a lot of thermal headroom to have to deal with. So if are they going to down clock? Are they going to down thermal it uh, to get it in notebooks of a certain form factor that are more appealing than most gaming machines? I don't know. It, it, it's it's a really interesting uh, transition that will happen with this. I think based on what we know of performance and, and footprint and uh, what Intel has planned for it. I think this is going to be of the, we talked about at the beginning the notebooks that are going to come out at CES. Um, these are the ones I'm most excited to see the ones I'm most excited to hold in my hands and see performance and see how things actually play out. No doubt. No doubt. Oh my goodness. One last thought before we uh, start running for CES. Um, Batteries are cheap if you have uh, an iPhone 6 or newer. <laughs> um, you know, there's it's been a, a crazy week and a half, right? Uh, the Verge reported that Apple confirmed that they did things to slow down uh, your CPU if your battery was of a certain age, basically to keep your phone from shutting down. Um, you know, but... Uh, the, the general understanding now is if you want to get your battery changed, it's only going to be $29, even if the uh, test Apple has built into the phone doesn't say your battery is worn out. Um, you know, this is this has been a, you know, speaking of, of lawsuits and craziness and insanity, uh, you know, the, the one thing that everybody was excited about was like, I'm not crazy. Apple really is slowing down my phone. And it's like, well, yes, lithium batteries get old and have problems because, you know, they, they do not last forever. Um but, uh, you know, the iPhone battery replacements are down, you know, to $29 from $79 if you have an iPhone 6 or later. Uh, and the rumor is that the geniuses have been told to just replace the battery, uh, even if your battery actually isn't technically worn out. Uh, more details up on Apple.com. Actually, uh, for the sheer unbridled joy of seeing what the performance difference was before and after I've ordered an iFixit kit, which is also selling for $29. Uh, and if I completely lose my mind, I may actually install that uh, uh, while I'm at CES, because 
what could be more exciting than trashing my phone at CES? <laughs> Cracking my phone <laughs> open, which I'm yeah. really comfortable doing at this point. But even I think that might not be the brightest move. Um, you know, the uh, I, I will be curious to see you know how this shakes out in the long run, uh, and uh, you know I'm very curious to see what the before and after because I can benchmark, I, I can geek bench like the before and after on the phone, but I'm also curious day to day if it feels faster. Uh, uh, before and after. Uh, but more on that uh, in the next week or two after CES. With that, ladies and gentlemen, mm-hmm. we got to get Ryan out of here because he has to pack. PCPer.com is the place to go if you need more Ryan Shrout, Alan Malventano, and the rest of the crew. And if you like hardware, you should be regularly going over to PC Perspective. That's PCPer.com. You can find me talking about home theater and audio with Robert Heron on AVXL.com. And of course, I host weekly tech thing with Shannon Morris where we kind of geek out and answer viewer questions and talk about hardware and software and I am hopefully will not be talking about smart underwear next week at CES but stranger things will have happened and with that patch your systems get your battery upgraded drink a lot of water if you're going to CES oh we're having a hangout Tuesday night at CES uh, if y'all are available Details on that are at facebook.com slash tech thing or just check my Twitter feed because it's all up there. I don't know if Ryan can make it because he's basically working 30-hour days at CES. But if you can make it, dude, (laughs) it's an arcade inside the MGM. You'll love it. They have beer and video games. (laughs) Hmm. All right. You said some key things there. All right. I try. I try. And those those basketball things. I I got three. Oh, okay. All right. Papa shots. Let's do it. Papa shot. You'll crush me (laughs) at Papa shots. I'm pretty sure I can take you in pool. We'll find. All right. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Shrout. See you next week on Twitch.